All right, guys, I'm here with Sam. Uh, we've got a lot to talk about, and uh, we're going to try to get this done in 50 minutes. You ready? I'm ready. Sounds right. good. Awesome. Thanks for coming. Thank you. It's great. Great to be here. What uh, What's your background? So I'm a computer scientist and a neuroscientist, I guess, by background. Uh, I'm also an entrepreneur. Uh, a long time ago, I was doing research uh, at Johns Hopkins in cognitive science and like vision and trying to figure out the human brain and the nature of reality based on neuroscience, I guess. And I realized as the financial crisis was happening that I didn't know anything about uh, what money was. So got really into money, uh, the definition of money, and joined up with some nerds and made some uh, some paper currencies in Baltimore called the Baltimore B note. All right, so hold on, <laughs> hold on, hold on. <laughs> you, what year is this? Uh, two thousand eight ish. Yeah. All right, so not Satoshi, but in two thousand and eight, yep. you created a paper based currency that was used in just Baltimore, or aspirations to go larger it, than that. It was intended to be local. It was okay. basically a discount to the dollar in that region. And sometimes it stretched into Pennsylvania. It's still still around actually. But the idea was to sort of close the supply loops inside of Baltimore and act like a loyalty point system there. But it was kind of just an experiment for me to learn about monetary theory. But that same crew of people is how I got into Bitcoin and uh, it's permeated my life. Since Sh- that. Shocking that the people creating their own currency <laughs> ended up with Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so you do that. And then when, um, when do you, or, or well, hold on, let's go into, uh, cause then you worked at a couple startups, right? Yeah. And, and yeah. So, so back then I was uh, a scientist, basically I was doing applied science stuff, did some, some DOD work. I did some stuff for like Lamborghini, building uh, biosensors, artificial intelligence, stuff like that. Um, And followed this whole crypto world, didn't really know what to do with it, ended up being CTO of a different company called Atmosphere as I was getting into the the startup scene. I realized that service business models aren't that great, uh, but you know, I I co-founded an applied science company before that. Ended up being CTO of this company. Right, uh, Right during that company is when Ethereum got invented. And I followed Bitcoin the whole time, uh, but I didn't really want to make a wallet or an exchange or something. You know, I didn't really see a startup business model I wanted in that. But then I met Joe Lubin, uh, heard about the the white paper of Ethereum like exactly at the same time, and it just just clicked that it was a decentralized virtual machine that would allow uh, programmable money, allow basically decentralized any application you can think of, and it clicked for me immediately, and I knew I had to do something with it. All right, so. When do you find out? Like, when does somebody tell you about Ethereum? Uh, it was Joe Lubin. In, oh, so Joe in, told you? Yeah. So it was okay. mid. So I had heard about this thing. Mm-hmm. Everyone from my Bitcoin friend said this is the coolest thing ever. Like, you got to mm-hmm. learn about it. But like, I hadn't read the white paper. Uh, everyone that tried to explain it to me, I was like, "What the hell are you talking about? Doesn't doesn't make any sense." Mm-hmm. Um, and so I heard there was this thing, Ethereum. Go to this meetup, and 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 you'll hear what it is. And it was it was Joe and me and maybe 15, 20 other people. And Joe told me what it was, clicked immediately. And uh, I walked across Manhattan, I remember just in, in a altered state of consciousness, realizing that the world was about to change. Mm-hmm. Uh, and shortly after that, joined up with him to help build consensus. Got it. And so many people, I think, have heard of Joe, but they don't know him, they've never met him, etc. Just give people, like, why did you believe him? Right, like, like what, what was kind of the what was kind of the um, the reaction that you had to him, and now knowing him really well, right? That that um, um, you know left you walking across Manhattan, <laughs> figuring out what life is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Joe, you know, Joe's a computer scientist for one, and so also being a computer scientist, uh, you can kind of cut through the shit of a whole you know, set of paragraphs in, in in one sentence: decentralized virtual machine. That immediately, I, I got it. And just from the level of discourse that was happening in that initial meeting of, of just decentralization, removing intermediaries, uh, the fact that it behaves like Bitcoin, but it also has the ability to program behavior on top of it, just that that concept resonated uh, so strongly for me. And Joe's ability to articulate that, I could tell he really believed it. Mm-hmm. I also I also knew that you know Joe basically had come out of retirement to do this, right? He was he was chilling out in Jamaica uh, and he doesn't need to go have a job, uh, mm-hmm. but but he was having the conviction to do this. So 
uh, we immediately, we also vibed on, on neuroscience, actually. Joe's also a, a neuroscientist by background. Uh, and so... What's up with the uh, computer science neuroscientists over in Brooklyn, man? What are you guys doing? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. I think, well, you know, I think, I think we share um, a, a desire to figure out how the world works and how the human mind works. And I, I, view, I view Ethereum, frankly, and I view blockchain as a way to think about the extension of human cognition. And that's really what I was into it in from the beginning is, is that, like, this is the expression of the human mind as is money, right? And the way, to the extent that the banking industry and the central banking industry, et cetera, uh, is in control of the way new money gets issued and created and the way it behaves and the way we structure financial products, that, that determines the course of people's lives, right? That you have, a, you have a, a mortgage, you spend your whole life paying that mortgage back. Uh, the structure of how you do that and why you do that and how that integrates into your life is determined by uh, some other people, not most people, and that determines how humans behave in mass. So the same things that I think make a neuroscientist interested in human behavior could also make them interested in money and monetary theory, and that's that's where I was coming from. I think partially that's where Joe's coming from too. That's super cool. I really like that uh, the way you describe that. All right, so what is consensus, right? So and, and we maybe let's start with what it is, and then we can get into uh, you know some of the early days and, and what that was like. So currently, consensus obviously is a lot of things, right? <laughs> uh, so consensus, we say there are a few pillars to consensus, right? There's, there's the, the venture studio, which we call Consensus Labs. And that's where we, we build, we fund, we cause synergies between all these portfolio companies. A lot of you heard of like MetaMask, Truffle, Infura, you know, Kaleido, et cetera. Uh, so there's that part of the company. Uh, I can go into the details of why it's structured that way later. Uh, there's consensus ventures uh, where we, you know, we have a typical looking venture fund. Um, we also do some balance sheet investing as well. You've probably seen our investments in like Drum G, for instance, uh, you know, projects like that pretty recently. We have consensus solutions, which is simultaneously a consulting organization and also a digital venturing organization. So uh, things like Comgo, things like the AMD partnership that we recently announced, um, those are deals where we basically partner with another company or a set of other companies in the case of like Comgo, for instance, and we being blockchain tech experts build out the tech platform. We have some equity or ownership of that thing. And, you know, it's basically a joint venture between us and, and some other experts in a certain field or something. Right. So we've got that. We have Consensus Academy as well. Uh, we have a social impact arm as well, where, where we do projects that we think benefit the world. Um, and, you know, a few other smaller services. But basically, you know, we're in the business of deploying capital either in a very hands-on way or, or, in a, or in a distant venture capital kind of way. And we're in the business of helping other companies and partnerships realize the power of blockchain technology. So lots of different moving pieces, but that, that's our, our goal set. And what was it like in the early days, right? Because I've heard plenty, right? now. obviously I know a couple of people who have been there and, and – it feels a little bit like a, like a revolution, right? <laughs> like, a, hey, we're, we believe something in the world that a high majority of other people don't believe, and if we work together, we can go build this. Yeah, yeah. So late 2014, early 2015, you know, it was a bunch of, bunch of crazy people in a, in a room, a bunch of crazy smart people in a room that, that I think saw this thing before everyone else. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I can analogize it to, you know, the people who saw that oil and steel before everything else uh, you know, it, it felt like that. It felt like we know something that the rest of the world doesn't know yet. Uh, and some of the smartest people I've ever met in my life were collected there. And in the very early days of consensus, there weren't, there weren't really the tools to go get things to market really quickly, right? There was Bitcoin. There's stuff built around Bitcoin. But if you analogize it to the Internet, people, people like to say, you know, people make up all kinds of numbers, like we're 94, 95 right now. But I would say in the very beginning, kind of like 91, right, where HTTP, the protocol, had been invented. We knew that this HTTP thing would be awesome. But we don't have a browser. We don't have a web server. We certainly don't have AWS and load balancers mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Yeah. So, you know, in, in 91, if I wanted to build Snapchat, I would have had to build all those things, right? Mm -hmm. It would have been very capital intensive. It would have been not something that a typical venture investor wanted to invest in, right? So... So, but yet at the same time, we saw, you know, we saw Snapchat, we saw Facebook, we saw, we saw the, all the powerful things that could be built on this that are, that are now being built and people understand the power of. So 
how do you build that thing, right? How, how do you build the entire ecosystem at once was really the question we set out to solve. And so if we had just made a fund, it would have been too early, right? We would have just been handing capital to people that would have had to reproduce each other's work. And if we had just made one company, uh, we thought that was ill-advised, right? Because how many people set out to build 50 things at once and are successful in a startup company? Not, not many I know of. So the difference is, the, you know, you strike the difference, and we decided to build a company that builds companies and put everyone under one roof, get them to exchange ideas, get them to rapidly iterate on things. And so in the early days, we were basically like, you know, there are only a handful of people in the world who even understand how to build a, a, an application on Ethereum. So let's start building them. Let's start building games. Let's start building loan platforms. Let's start building prediction markets. And let's use that to motivate uh, Infura and MetaMask and Truffle, all those things that now everyone else in the Ethereum community used, uh, uses. We built because we needed them to build the vision of what we were trying to do. So we said, let's build all that stuff. We'll cut it up into, into different companies and projects later. For every successful startup that you come up, you, you see come out of uh, consensus, there were a bunch of things that, that didn't work or, or that you know were an idea that uh, some engineers explored for a little bit but, but didn't turn into a company. But um, that was the sort of capitally efficient um, way to seed an entire ecosystem that, that we designed. So lots of people working on the next generation of stuff is how it felt in the early days. In those days, uh, employees were getting paid in fiat or Ethereum? <laughs> um, Bitcoin, actually, a lot. Really? Yeah. Okay. Um, but but some you know some people wanted to be paid in normal uh, dollars and things. Like but sa- yeah, like a like a sane people money, right? At the time. <laughs> yeah, I think you know so some. <laughs> Their but, landlords weren't taking Bitcoin yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I you know I actually tried it, and, and none of them <laughs> none of them really really would do it. Uh, but no, in the early days, uh, I remember when I first joined up with Joe, uh, I I said, you know, let's 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 start this, like, you know, and I didn't have a hiring process or something, you know, it was just sort of me and Joe hanging out in a room, and uh, he was like, yeah, I'll just send you some bitcoins, good, sure. Right. <laughs> so uh, I think a lot of the early early days, people like bitcoins as good of a, as a dollar, if not better, to them. Yep, and, and so as you guys start this, um, did you start out with? all of the kind of different you know bodies of work right so the venture studio and the fund and all that or was there a progression as to hey let's start building first right that you just described and then okay hey maybe actually now there's enough people in the ecosystem that we could fund other companies like i'm guessing it's a prog- progression but you tell me yeah certainly a progression uh when when we started uh the way consensus got put together was really there were a few Companies like like Gnosis, for instance, was out there. Um, there were some some other smaller teams that were already kind of working on something, and and we just sort of brought them into the fold of consensus and started paying them and you know making some agreements with them about how we would, we, we would collaborate. Um, and you know, like I said, in the very early days, uh, Joe and I sat down and said, you know, should what should this be on paper, right? Should this be a fund? Should this be a company? Should it be something in between? And and we ended up deciding that it should be a company for for the reason that it seemed too early. That you know there weren't there weren't mature entrepreneurs. Uh, everyone would have had to duplicate each other's work. It would have been an inefficient use of capital to really just make a pure fund. And we wanted to be more hands on and let people collaborate mm-hmm. and not worry about their intellectual property getting traded back and forth, et cetera. So um, yeah, so those early days, uh, it was really just move as fast as possible. And then as things have matured, you know, it didn't, even in 2015, 2016 especially, if you go Google Ethereum and you Google blockchain applications, it didn't take very long to find us. So governments, Fortune 500 companies, entities like that started approaching us and asking us for help. And at first we said, you know, I'm not that interested in helping you. I'm trying to, you know, I I want to, but I'm trying to make companies here. I'm not going to consult for you. But eventually, you know, in my mind, we realized and we hired the right kind of people to basically build a consulting organization that can take our infrastructure tools like, like uh, you know, like Infura, et cetera, uh, take all of the things we built for ourselves, port that over and build solutions for different companies and governments. And, uh, and that, that organization just become increasingly professional and, and more and more so. And then, you know, eventually uh, the market has matured to a point where it does make sense to 
hand capital to a mature entrepreneur and not be as hands on. And that's the motivation for us having a fund and, and doing some balance sheet investments as well. So, you know, over time, it's just as the market's matured, we've hired the right people and, and adapted to, to it. But yeah, we're, we're, we're a really adaptable organization. We do all kinds of weird stuff and whatever makes sense and whatever will get things over the line. So we, we just acquire the right expertise and perform in whatever way we think the market needs. What do you, there's plenty of people who are huge fans, right? And I think it, it speaks for itself just how many people are involved, right? How much the ecosystem has been built out and a huge piece of it is uh, attributable to the work you guys did. But there's also people who, you know, think you guys are crazy and, you know, that this is never going to work type <laughs> Good. stuff. Right? Yeah. Well, I was going to say, what, what's the one detraction that people would have that you would agree with? Is there one? It's an interesting question. Um, I think um, if I had to detract from consensus, it's, it's probably that we're early. Mm-hmm. Um, That's fair. You know, uh, this this whole world is yet to be uh, fully realized. And, you know, sometimes it takes a while for a technology to reach maturity. Um, and I think we all see it and we see how important it is. And I, and I think you do too. And, and that's why we're here. Um, and so I think it'll be a while before the average consumer has something in their pocket that, that is using blockchain. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's not going to be that one. It's, it's already the case now that, you know, industry players, financial companies, et cetera, are starting to use it. But, um, but we've, you know, we've, we've got a long road and a lot of infrastructure to build and a lot of, um, a lot of roads to pave even. And so, um, if I were building a company right now, I think it would be a hell of a lot easier than us building it four years ago. So that's, that's probably a valid criticism. Okay. I think that's definitely fair. Let's talk about some of the projects that you guys, uh, or the work you guys have done. Um, obviously you guys have done a ton in Dubai. So maybe just give us an overview of kind of what you guys have done, what you're doing now and, and maybe where that's going. Yeah. So, uh, lots of governments see applications of of blockchain technology, things like property rights, things like, uh, voting, things like identity systems, uh, are pretty important to them. So, uh, a couple of years ago, Dubai, uh, the Dubai future foundation basically said they want to build, um, something having to do with blockchain. Right. And they have this great program where they invite you to Dubai. You meet up with Dubai holding, which is their sovereign wealth, uh, group. Uh, a bunch of other companies in Dubai, basically try to see what you can do to get Dubai to the to the future, because mm-hmm. that's very much their their vibe and what they're trying to accomplish is they they want to be a next generation city and a next generation society, and so we along with IBM were named through that process uh, the official blockchain advisors of Dubai, and we built an office there. We started working with their uh, Dubai property group uh, was our first project as well as some of the other government offices through Smart Dubai which runs all their basically their smart city initiative oversees all their their government services and just looking one by one to see what we can blockchainify uh, so to say and uh, the first thing we identified was their property registries right because a, a piece of property gets it gets essentially granted to a development organization that thing goes through 20 different government offices to sign off on the plan, uh, which usually results in literally hundreds of millions of kilometers being driven or with pieces of paper being driven around Dubai per year. Uh, and then, uh, and then eventually ends up in the ownership of an individual. And obviously right now, I think to, to people listening to this that are into blockchain, they know that asset digitization and, you know, custody of assets and, and the, the, um, cryptographic signing of, of assets is a, a pretty strong aspect of blockchain. And they saw that back then that like, instead of having a piece of property that's represented by a piece of paper that goes to 20 different offices and then ends up with 50 other pieces of paper and you buy it instead, why don't we have a digital representation of that? Why don't we have the land titling and registry system, uh, not only on blockchain, like, like factum or something, but actually a complete application that manages that whole process. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we started building that out for them. Um, and then, you know, as time goes on, we're just going through their whole government suite of services, basically, and, and blockchainifying it. Uh, I, I joke a lot that uh, blockchain is just an assault on paper. Right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. And there's a lot of paper in government, so <laughs> it makes yeah. sense that's why people are looking there. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's true. I mean, pieces of paper are 
not only bulky and need to be moved around, but but insecure, right? And and uh, you, you can't you can't fly with a million pages of something, and you know you can steal a million pieces of hundred dollar bills. You know, um, there are a lot of advantages over it for, for sure. Um, all right, so let's move somewhere else in the world. Uh, Singapore, you guys have done some work with uh, some monetary organizations there and stuff. Yeah, so the Monetary Authority of Singapore is a, an organization that we've we've done some work with, and you know, basically just worked on some some trading infrastructure for them. Um, you know, I think the work that we did there, uh, you can you can view as porting uh, more fully into something that that we've done recently called Comgo. Uh, and that's us, Society General, uh, City, but maybe about ten partners actually. That's a commodities uh, trading and trade finance platform that uh, we recently started working on. And I think that that's really the full realization of that. Um, and so, what that'll allow you to do is do at first KYC and letters of credit, um, but eventually you could view that as solving a lot of the again paper inefficiencies, but of, of trade finance and allowing allowing commodities and, and trade finance in general to just be extremely efficient, um, you know, and it's an open platform so that anyone who wants to plug into it can. Uh, I think that's really the future, less so than a closed system that just makes something 1% or 5% more mm-hmm. efficient, an open platform that allows anyone in the world who wants to participate in trade finance to plug into it permissionlessly. Um, that's That's the direction we're going. Got it. Um, and then you've created some uh, identification work in uh, Zoog. Yeah. About that? Yeah. So Zoog, uh, for people who don't know, Zoog is a, a canton in Switzerland. It's kind of like a state in the United States. Um, and Zoog is also the place where Crypto Valley is. Um, you know, a lot of companies are structured there, and the government there is really sophisticated in, in their understanding of blockchain. They have been for a while. And so our platform, Uport, which is our identity management system on, on Ethereum, is now coupled with their official government identity system. So when you go get a, uh, a an ID card uh, for a citizen in Zug, you simultaneously get a Uport ID that's cryptographically linked to your ID card, and you can use that to access government services, including voting, actually. And I think a few months ago, they did some of their first votes uh, on that platform, um, which in Swiss society is actually really important to them. Their ability to directly vote on decisions uh, is one is a unique aspect, I think, of Swiss culture, and uh, they're happy to support that. And I think the eventual goal is we'll keep adding things to that. You know, mm-hmm. like just like in in uh, in Sweden, you know, you have a cryptographic ID that lets you access all your different banks. Uh, the vision there is let's build a dynamic identity infrastructure that is more secure than it could normally be, uh, based on blockchain that will let every government service eventually be plugged into. Got it. So. We just kind of went around uh, outside the United States, right? Dubai, uh, Singapore, and uh, Zug. Um, what is your perspective on those foreign governments or jurisdictions' uh, view on liquid crypto, right? So everything you're talking about is enterprise blockchain or uh, building kind of more applications of the blockchain technology to solve problems, right? Bitcoin, right, as digital money, Ethereum, you know, the, the actual liquid assets, are they positive, negative, agnostic, think that everyone's a snake oil salesman, <laughs> kind of, where, where, where do they come out on it? Yeah, um, I don't want to speak for any of the governments, so, you know, yeah, don't, yeah, don't. Just, <laughs> just, just, and what I'm really looking for is, like, general sentiment, right? Do you think that most of them are uh, intrigued, or do you think they think that's all completely, you know, garbage and it's kind of the you know not bitcoin but blockchain type stuff yeah um i think they are intrigued um neutral to positive in 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 my experience um switzerland was one of the first places and switzerland obviously has a history of being pretty forward thinking and and uh privacy oriented in in their banking money and privacy in (laughs) switzerland's been uh been a hot topic for them for a while (laughs) yeah yeah exactly and so so, you know, the Ethereum Foundation is structured mm-hmm. in Switzerland. And the reason they were is one of the reasons they were is because the government there was able to understand that you could treat Ethereum as a currency even before it mm-hmm. was it was put out. And, you know, this is a time when most governments had no idea. Mm-hmm. They had no clue what we were talking about. And 
um, they were able to go so far as to actually make a you know a, an agreement with them that they would treat ether even before Ethereum had been launched uh, as as a currency. Wow. Um, and so that represents, I think, a pretty forward-looking view. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in places like Dubai and places like Singapore, uh, I think they want to be. They want to be societies that that advance to the next level pretty quickly, right? Mm-hmm. Dubai, uh, Dubai is looking for ways to make sure that they're uh, they're leading the next wave of economic uh, evolution of our planet. Uh, that's why you know you see such new stuff. Years ago, they were talking about flying taxis. You know, years ago they're talking about about blockchain, and. Um, you know they're much more apt to move on on things uh, quickly than than some other societies that are that are a little slower and that you know we already got it figured out so we don't want to mess it up is the attitude in in some maybe Western democracies. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas whereas a place that um, wants to move quickly, I think they're very open to the the liquid crypto aspect of it. Um, and I think central banks as well, uh, obviously. There was a report uh, put out by Bank of International Settlements, I believe, a few days ago about how something like 70 percent of central banks are considering this. So I think, you know, I think uh, there's a general attitude tw- in, in governments that we need to do something about this. We need to have an approach, uh, whether, you know, I don't think the, you know, the U.S., for instance, is going to be the first central bank to issue a cryptocurrency. But uh, at the same time, I think governments would be remiss they know that they would be remiss not to consider how they can integrate this into their existing infrastructure Mm -hmm. i think that's fair um all right let's talk about ethereum um we will call out so all of the uh the the trolls on twitter know yes he (laughs) he is biased (laughs) we know (laughs) um but uh, no seriously what where is Ethereum today, right? In, in your mind, kind of, what are the pros and cons, or, or maybe not even cons, just what are the, the things that are going well, and what are the things that are challenges that need to be resolved going forward? Sure. So going back to, like, 2014, when I talked to people about Ethereum, most people said, oh, that's so ambitious, that's crazy, like, it's never even going to work, right? Mm-hmm. And every year, it, you know, well, you know, you're not going to be able to, to launch it. And then, you know... The next year is, well, no one's going to be able to develop any applications. Mm-hmm. Then, well, the applications don't have any users. And that, you know, so the, the criticisms keep moving, the, the goalposts keep moving, and we keep keep hitting the goals. Um, but, you know, I think Ethereum is at a place where you can already do basic functionality that supplants existing parts of the financial system, right? Make or die. Wild. Cra- Wild. Crazy, right? Listen, shout out to Rick Burton <laughs> and the balance team. I went over there uh, recently, and they sat me down. And they walked me through this whole thing. I was blown away. Yeah, yeah, and it's crazy. You know, I, I I basically have collateralized loans with no human beings necessary. Um, so okay, so so this is actually good. So maybe let's talk about what could actually be done applying Ethereum and, and the functionality to it. Let's use Maker Die as a, as an example. Um, maybe first describe just what is Maker's. You know, vision and, and kind of make or die, and then we can get into the CDPs and stuff. Sure. So, so Maker basically it's a platform. You know, the CDPs are a, are a, uh, the name. It's collateralized debt position on there. It's basically an Ethereum smart contract. It exists today. You, uh, it's it, it has a complementary stablecoin called Dai that represents a dollar, right? And so the basic idea is, I have you know, I I want a loan for you know a million dollars. Uh, I forget what the ratio is. I think it's 1.5x, 2x. Um, so I can put $2 million in this smart contract. It spits out a $1 million of die, right? And as as the price of Ethereum fluctuates, that contract automatically rebalances itself such that there's always the right amount of collateral. It's in a certain range. So Ethereum price goes down. You need to put a little bit more. Ethereum price goes up. You you can take a little bit more die out, essentially. And so you've got a stable coin and you've got a collateralized debt position and you know essentially you're doing something that normally takes weeks of conversations and AML KYC and going to bankers offices and signing things uh, to get a you know to get a million dollar loan uh, ba- even if even if it's collateralized now I can do it in a smart contract in a few seconds mm-hmm. um, and so that's that's basically and the part that's pretty crazy about this is in a normal lending scenario the lender would have to be a person 
that would then have to get information from the borrower or information on the asset they're lending against. They would have to have some ability to recover and liquidate the collateral, right? The car yep. loan or whatever. Yep. Uh, and then there's a lot of cost that comes from issuing the loan, managing the loan, you know, recouping the loan, et cetera. In this scenario, you're putting up an over collateral, you know, you're putting up more collateral than you're taking on the loan. So there's a whole host of the complexities that are reduced and you're doing it in automated fashion, right? Yep. Cause the way here, here's the, and I'd love to hear your thought about this. So make or die is a perfect example of, I think of blockchain as simply the foundation for all of the automation that everyone's waiting for. Right. Yep. It is, we're going to tokenize all the stocks, bonds, currencies, and commodities, right? It is the ability for smart contracts to execute things without human intervention. Yep. This is all the foundational pieces you need for that automation. And it looks like these CDPs are one of the first applications of that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really, really clear example. And, and you combine that with, we have a platform called Open Law. Okay. What's which, that? So it's created by uh, a, a really great legal team. Um, uh, out of, out of uh, Cardozo Law School. Uh, and so basically, it is a simultaneous English prose contract that is a legally enforceable contract that is connected to a smart contract deployed to Ethereum. So that could be something like, uh, say I hire an employee and once a month their equity vests you know, 1% or something like mm-hmm. that. So instead of a lawyer having to compute that and then keep a record of the, in the share register of who has what shares, et cetera, and then actually giving them the shares, or, you know, and then you IPO the company and then, you know, and then they have the shares somehow and they need to get onto the stock exchange, whatever. Instead, uh, it is a smart contract that once a month sends them some tokens that represent a share to them and that's it. Um, we actually use that in our Ujo music platform as well to manage music rights. So, mm-hmm. you know, you could imagine what normally requires law firms and court systems and accountants and lawyers to enact, just like just like this uh, this loan that we're talking about, um, instead you have a legally enforceable contract with all the right pros and fallback conditions or whatever that also automatically executes uh, of you know pretty arbitrary complexity. So I think that that's certainly the future. That's where we're going. Yeah, it it, it is. Um, it's pretty wild. So let's say that this all happens, right? And I. We're obviously talking about it, so we, we believe. Um, what is the reaction or the possible options that the legacy financial system has? Do they jump on board or do they get completely disrupted? What's more probable? <laughs> uh, that's an interesting question. Well, you know, I like to say... It's not binary, right? <laughs> but but kind of yeah. what's your take on that? I mean, you look at the, the logo of Wells Fargo. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a horse with a carriage, right? And that carriage was carrying gold. Uh, uh, I did. I did not know that. That is a dangerous, <laughs> dangerous thing for me to tweet. <laughs> uh, so um, you know, Wells Fargo has obviously advanced their business model beyond carrying gold in carriages. Um, and financial institutions are full of smart people that will continue to adapt, and I hope that they do. Um, in the beginning of consensus, I was honestly afraid that we would get fierce pushback from the legacy financial system. And I thought that they would make huge problems for us. Turns out, um, you know, if you look at the members of the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, for instance, most of the major banks are using Ethereum right now, mm-hmm. um, and because they realize that better to be disrupt, or, you know, better to disrupt yourself than be disrupted. Mm-hmm. And so I see, you know, especially you know the like innovators and and you know young people in banks at first. You know, at first it was the sort of innovation departments, and, and now it's now it's CIOs and 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 you know the more senior people that are finally like, oh, okay, yeah, I see, I see how this could completely disrupt our whole business model. Mm-hmm. Um, finally, getting on board. So I think, you know, big institutions, big ships are slow to steer, and probably some of them will fail. Um, but I, you know, in the big medium term picture to long term picture, I think you know the next Goldman Sachs and the, and the next you know maybe decentralized version of Goldman Sachs has, has yet to be built. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I think um, I, I think there are going to be kids, you know, with a laptop in Africa that make up something that no one in, in you know, we're in, we're in Manhattan right now. I don't think anyone in Manhattan is going to even think of. Mm-hmm. And they don't even know that it violates some banking regulation in London or whatever. And, and, and they're and, not going to care. And they don't care at all because it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. And they're going to deploy that thing. 
uh, and then people are going to start using it, right? Whether mm-hmm. it's CDPs on, on Maker uh, or it's something else that I can't think of because I'm too old and, and dumb that you know a 14-year-old is going to make up. Um, I think that's going to be wildly different than our existing financial reality, and I don't. I, I think it's going to happen quickly, uh, mm-hmm. and and people aren't going to be prepared. But at the same time, you know, we're helping financial institutions. Lots of companies are helping financial institutions. Uh, J.P. Morgan has been really uh, on the forefront, despite what Mr. Diamond may say. Um, you know, they've they've been working on Quorum, which is a privacy layer for Ethereum. Uh, you know, they're uh, they've been pushing pretty hard, and I, I I see some real innovation coming out of existing institutions. Mm-hmm. It, it is funny because um, there's some institutions that don't want to be associated with this stuff at all. There's yep. some that actually think there's a benefit to being associated, right? They want to try to own the the narrative. Uh, but I don't know a single institution that's doing nothing, and I don't know a single institution that said we're not going to work on anything else other than this, right? Everyone's kind of yep. in the middle, and they all have different reasons for choosing, you know, what they do. But your, your point about, um, you know, the next Goldman Sachs looks different, right, and, and probably has some stuff, you know, has something to do with this. Uh, ben Horowitz recently was asked on a um, uh, on a, in, in an interview, um, you know about mobile phones and the internet and killer apps and all this stuff. And he said, you know, the thing that people forget about mobile phones is that uh, it was actually worse in every single way than a PC, except for a very small number of ways, right? And it had GPS, it had a a camera on it, right? It could fit in your pocket, like, you know, things like that. But people also were saying, you know, it's less powerful. How the hell am I going to do, I I think his quote was like, you know, how the hell am I going to do my spreadsheet on that little ass screen, (laughs) right? You know, that type of stuff. And so the, the, reason why it's important is you couldn't build Uber or Lyft without the phone, yep. right? Without the GPS and, and things like that. You couldn't build, you know, the Instagrams and Snapchats of the world without the camera, right? And so, you know, it, it's, um, he, he brings it kind of full circle. And he says, you know, what does a blockchain have that other computing powers don't have? Yep. He says trust, right? And, and I would almost take it a step further. It has trust and the decentralization component is really important, both for trust, security, you know, a whole host of things. And so, when you think of the legacy financial institution, the first word that pops your head is not trust, <laughs> right? Like, yep. you know, we, we joke all the time, you know, long Bitcoin, short the bankers. Yep. <laughs> it's, it's a you know play on words, but there is a lot of distrust. And so I wonder how much of your view on where some of this stuff goes is reliant on people continuing to trust institutions versus one thing I think a lot about is people are just going to trust machines more than humans. Yeah. Right. So the algorithms, the machines, like we've already, you know, Google yep. Maps, perfect example. You've already given up, right? You just hey, that it's smarter than any human <laughs> I ask on the street. Yep. Are there other things? You know, CDPs might be a great example where people trust the algorithms in the machine more than organizations. Yep. I think that's uh, one of the important reasons for decentralization. I, 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 okay. You know, explain a lo- that. A lot of people say the word decentralization and uh, you know as some kind of battle cry, but. I don't. I don't think a lot of people really understand why that's so important, and, and and it's for trust, right? It's because if no one controls it, right? If no one can get an outsized influence on the behavior of the system, then I know the system is going to behave in the way that I think it's going to behave, mm-hmm. right? And this is why, you know, it, going back to Ethereum's design, for instance, this is why Vitalik considered like DPoS, right? Uh, mm-hmm. uh, delegated proof of stake, which is the underlying protocol of EOS, for instance. And rejected it, right? Because he felt that twenty-one deciders, twenty-one validators, is not enough to be decentralized. It's it's not enough that if a state actor um, wanted to go tell them what to do uh, to censor a transaction, for instance, uh, that it that it wouldn't happen, right? Mm -hmm. And so, the degree to which you can trust is dependent upon the degree to which the system performs in the way that you think it will. Um, and, and it requires decentralization. So, and I agree with you also on the point about trust, that all of the systems that financial institutions are part of, and the the you know, the, the interfaces to them, and the regulatory environments around them, are all designed to produce trust. Right. Mm-hmm. The reason why I trust a bank more than a guy on the street, if I hand him a thousand dollars and say keep this for me, the reason I trust a bank more is because if a bank doesn't do it. There's a whole bunch of legal systems that cost money, court systems, regulators, police forces, whatever, and that are going to go knock on their door and say, hey, you know, you're violating the law by not mm-hmm. holding that thousand dollars. Right. So I'm paying for this giant societal machinery that enables that trust and, and the 
the shape of a financial institution, right? I'm, you know, I'm looking across the street at, you know, a, a financial institution, like, pro- you know, how many floors of that building are for compliance, right? How many of floors of the building are people whose only job it is to make sure that they implement the trust framework that's been mandated by our society. Well, how many square feet are filled with paper? <laughs> <laughs> right? <True. laughs> they could really uh, reduce the rent over there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and so, you know, if you can do the same stuff because it's in a smart contract on a decentralized platform, suddenly our whole society is a lot wealthier and happier. Mm-hmm. We can do stuff for cheaper and we can probably do stuff that you couldn't do before because right now those humans can only move at the speed of a piece of paper and, and a and a phone call, mm-hmm. whereas a smart contract can articulate itself, you know, fairly quickly. Mm-hmm. All right, so let's switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, the AMD partnership because I think this is really fascinating, right? It, it probably actually didn't get enough attention, right? That, yep. that it, it got some press, but uh, maybe just talk a little bit about what that is and, and, and why you guys are excited about uh, moving forward there. Sure. So the project is called Web Three Cloud or Web Cloud with a three instead of an E, um, and <laughs> this is this is a partnership between us and AMD, uh, basically to produce the next generation of cloud infrastructure uh, to run things like Ethereum applications mm-hmm. on, right? And AMD is an interesting partner because they produce CPUs and GPUs, um, unlike you know Intel or Nvidia or whatever. There's, they sort of sit across that that boundary. Um, and then, you know, secondly, we believe that the the architecture uh, and the workload of the Web 3.0 is going to look a little bit different than the current architecture, and it and it sort of dovetails with what we're doing with Pegasus. So Pegasus is our uh, it's the name of our client um, for uh, Ethereum 2.0, and it's also uh, the just the name of our our team that works on that, but. Our client is different than all the other Ethereum clients in the sense that it is designed for our vision of there being what I would call state transfer. You know, that's a computer science word, but you know, basically information can go between the public Ethereum network and private versions of an Ethereum network that have different characteristics and topologies, right? And so, you know, if you look at IBM's view of the world, right? The hyperledger fabric view of the world. They're all about selling private blockchain. So me and five other banks or 20 other banks can all trade something with each other in this private version of a blockchain. And they would argue, some people who advocate that position would argue, you don't need a token. You don't need a Bitcoin or an Ether or whatever. We don't need crypto economic guarantees because it's all inside this private network. I personally, and, and you know, to consensus to some extent, doesn't believe that's the full vision. You know, And I think you probably... Uh, long Bitcoin uh, <laughs> don't believe that's the full answer either right the big picture is we create a fabric that connects the entire planet for permissionless financial behavior right with mm-hmm. rules applied to it like I can write a maker CDP and I can have a financial institution use that or a guy on the street use that and I can make you know a thousand other things that look like financial products that all are just sitting there like a public good that people can plug into Um, just like anyone can plug into the API of, you know, Amazon or or Google or something, right? It's just sitting there. You just plug into it and you can use it for something. You can can compose it with other things and construct this new financial reality that just sits on this fabric of of the internet that everyone has access to. At the same time, the security guarantees, the requirements for something like the public Ethereum network are different than, say, uh, a social network, right? Mm -hmm. I the the security guarantees and the way ethereum is designed it's designed for me to be able to hit like you know send on a billion dollar transaction and not worry about whether mm-hmm. it's going to get there right and that's that's the level of security and network topology etc of, of what ethereum is designed for at the same time say i'm a financial institution that has a whole bunch of stuff happening inside my firewall with maybe with a couple partners or something i don't necessarily want all that on the public ethereum network or maybe i want uh, something I'm doing to farm out to a, uh, an Amazon Lambda instance, which is like an mm. on-demand computing instance. Or maybe I want that to connect to a, uh, an on-demand storage instance that's sitting either on Amazon or in my own data center or whatever. What the Pegasus client is and, and the Enterprise Ethereum spec that uh, EEA, Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, put out is, is it's a way for one sort of one Ethereum client to both connect to the public Ethereum network and also connect to 
private things that the enterprises are used to having in their data centers. Mm -hmm. So I can have different different guarantees of trust, right? Like a like on Facebook doesn't need to have the same trust as a billion dollar transaction. Mm -hmm. I can do it cheaper and faster by using different topologies. Um, you know, I don't need to store uh, my movie collection in the same way I store my account balance, et cetera. So different network topologies uh, can exist on, on networks that are connected to, like side chains of Ethereum, like Loom Network, for instance, mm -hmm. and simultaneously connect to uh, the next generation of Ethereum, which is 2.0. And so we, we view supporting that infrastructure, supporting that sort of state transfer between public and private blockchains as the big picture of where this whole architecture is going. Mm -hmm. And our partnership with AMD uh, represents our, our view that there's a necessity to support that infrastructurally. That's awesome. What, um, what is the one or two uh, largest misconceptions about Ethereum? There, there are a lot of misconceptions about Ethereum. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think. What, what, what's, well, let's just talk about one. What, what do you no. think the biggest one? If you could clear one misconception about Ethereum, what would it be? The biggest one is is scalability. Right? Okay. That's, that's, Which is a huge conversation point right now. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's huge. It's you know probably the most important thing that we're trying to solve right now. Okay. Uh, Ethereum 2.0 is all about scalability. It's about some other things too, but. Um, you know, what most people don't realize, though, is that there are a lot of technologies that exist right now that already provide scalability for Ethereum applications. Right? Okay. So as I was saying before, you know, there are different, different requirements of trust have different required network topologies, if that makes sense. So um, what I need to send a billion dollars to someone, I want to make sure that the network completely agrees on that, right? I don't want there to be any chance that that gets messed up. I want very high security guarantees. And so sending that on the main chain Ethereum um, is, is the way to do that, and that's what Ethereum is designed to do. At the same time, if I want to send a like or I want to you know, move a character in a game or something, it doesn't need to be the same as, as a billion-dollar transaction. So uh, the solution to that and what has always been the solution to that that I think most people just don't realize is that there need to therefore be multiple layers of the stack of Ethereum? There mm -hmm. needs to be, you know, what some people call side chains, um, you know, or what we call L2. So L1 Ethereum is the main net Ethereum. L2 are things like Loom Network or mm -hmm. things like Plasma, where you know I can already get many thousands of transactions per second on those topologies, where I don't care about sending billions of dollars. Yep. Um, Ethereum 2.0 and you know and even some of the the changes happening right now moving to proof of stake etc those are all designed to get mainnet ethereum up to hundreds or even thousands of transactions per second and, and that's that timeline is well on its way a lot of it's proven a lot of it's you know on test nets etc uh, so I think most people don't get into the details of where that is and they don't realize how far that that uh, that work has already gone even though it probably won't be on mainnet for a year or, or a little more um, but I think also people just don't realize that that is never intended for the like on Facebook and you are always going to need these additional network layers in L2 or even L3 if you look at it uh, that allow people to have the characteristics they want right and so the the future vision that we see is a network of interconnected side chains, blockchains, even different things that aren't blockchains, maybe even, but are cryptographically guaranteed that all plug into the main fabric of Ethereum mainnet. And right now, there's really there's really nothing else that even comes close in terms of its ability to have the same trust and security guarantees and performance. So that's, you know, maybe that'll bring out some trolls on, on Twitter, but... Uh, if you don't got trolls, you're not doing anything. <laughs> that's the best job. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, before I finish up, I usually uh, do some rapid fire questions. Um, other sure. than consensus, what's the most important company in crypto? That's an interesting question. Uh, probably Coinbase. Why? Uh, because they are what most consumers see as the face of it. And if I were going to build... Um, the on-ramps for normal people, mm. I would start there. I'd start with really good UX, simple mm -hmm. enough for people to understand what's going on, simple enough and secure enough for them to have an identity on, on a blockchain mm -hmm. and uh, and get it into their hands. So actually, I guess Cash App 
uh, is is actually more ubiquitous right now for people. But mm-hmm. but I think Coinbase has a better sense of um, what consumers do. So they're the main entry point as it sits right now for consumers. So uh, it's supposed to be rapid fires, but now, <laughs> now you got me. Uh, I want to hear your opinion on. Um, well, usually when uh, people ask me this question, I say Facebook and not because uh, of what they've done yet, but whatever yep. they launch is yep. going to hit, you know, could be 2 billion people. Z- right? Zuck bucks or face coin? Uh, I like Zuck bucks. <laughs> 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 no, but, but, but it, it's just, it could be the first interaction that, you know, 2 billion people have with blockchains, crypto, whatever token, whether it's one they create or somebody else's. Yep. I mean, we're talking about a pretty important piece of technology and this is the exact same thought process. It's just that interface yep. right? and, and uh, whatever that interface is that most people interact with is going to be important. If anyone from Facebook is listening to it, you know, I, I hope they do it in a decentralized way. I hope they build on the existing infrastructure. So we get this network effect on all the, the genius people working on this right now. If, if they do something closed off, uh, I'll be sad. I, I'm going to go out on a limb. Uh, no. I usually, I usually don't, uh, comment on uh, future future <laughs> ideas that people may do yep. but my guess right now I, I work there so I have a general sense of the in, internal culture uh, my guess is very similar to you know when we think about banks there's plenty of people there who are excited about this technology and they want to apply it and and maybe there's some people who aren't as excited and so it slows it down or it's bureaucratic um, I bet you there's a lot of people at Facebook that are really excited about blockchain technology and crypto uh, probably a lot of people who participate in the ecosystem right yep. um, and I bet you there's a pretty serious conversation going on, you know, should it be decentralized or not, right? There's both sides that are, that are probably, you know, going. And uh, I'm with you that uh, I, I think that they're going to do it decentralized. Good. It, it would be, uh, yeah, it just, it feels like that's the right thing. There's enough people probably, you know, having that conversation. How you do it is hard, right? When you're kind of a for-profit company like that and, and you got some shareholders and all that. But uh, it'll be very interesting to see what they come out with. Yeah, I think so. So, all right. Um, what is the one thing that you believe that you think a high majority of other people would disagree with? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, I think that the I think that the part of of blockchains that ends up on private architectures, if you go in, you know, if you go into the the enterprise world of blockchain, mm-hmm. which I sit in a lot. Uh, I, I think almost none of it will end up on that. I, I think what's going to happen is uh, when people say they want private blockchains, what they're really saying is they want privacy and, and security um, and maybe some like composability and control. Mm-hmm. And I think the, the, the technology is getting to the place where, you know, if you, you put your infrastructure on something like Web3 Cloud, mm-hmm. uh, like I just described with AMD, um, and you know we have zk snarks and starks done, and we have a bunch of the scalability of side chains done. Uh, I think the public architecture, the internet, uh, analogized to like Ethereum, is way more powerful than the intranet, and I think mm-hmm. it's mostly going to be on that. Man, I hope you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I hope. Um, all right, if you could change or improve one regulation, what would it be? It's also an interesting question. Uh, I, I nice. I'm going. <laughs> I, I might hit 100 percent here. <laughs> so you know, I just speaking for myself as an individual. Uh, yeah, caveat: this is not a financial <laughs> advice. He's speaking for himself. Nothing to do with consensus. <laughs> um, I I think that we have. I think the whole crypto token boom mm-hmm. has demonstrated that there's a market gap for something between securities in a private offering to accredited investors and you know whether it's the jobs act or what you know mm-hmm. whatever we can do towards crowdfunding regulations i don't think those go nearly far enough mm-hmm. i think i think there's this huge market gap in between and we showed that and even though definitely some people got screwed and you know the sec is going after the people who are uh, scam artists i think that's good there's there's a market gap in between if you look at places like like wyoming right now actually mm-hmm. in the last few days announced a new a new class of financial instrument uh, mm-hmm. that they want to create, some regulators want to create. I think if you look at some other jurisdictions other than the U.S., they're treating this like token uh, stuff as a, as a completely different class of financial instrument mm-hmm. that needs a new approach, not just applying laws that we wrote in 1930. Um, and and I think I, I think we should be doing that. I, I think we should we should consider how we can make a new framework 
that captures the power of these things and doesn't slow it down. And if you look at, you know, people like Hester Pierce at, at the SEC, you know, she understands that um, uh, we don't want to get left behind. And, and, I, and I think we need to understand how our regulations can support entrepreneurs better. Mm-hmm. I, look, it, it is um, it's very interesting to see how a lot of these regulators, there's some that you know really believe and, and some who think that the world's ending. Right. And, and, <laughs> yeah. and, we, and we see it too at the federal and state level, right? To, to your point, Hester Pierce, I think, is a perfect example of the SEC, who she's been pretty blunt about what she believes, right? Yep. Um, if you look at you know the work that uh, some of the uh, the lawmakers and legislators in um, uh, Wyoming, right, with Caitlin Long and all that, and, and they've been super open to this stuff and, and uh, yep. want to push it forward. Or you even see, you know, uh, Josh Mandel, uh, treasurer in Ohio, right, say, hey, look, yep. bring it on, right? Let's take it for taxes. Uh, I think it's pretty interesting. Uh, what's the most important book you've ever read? Interesting question as well. Um, the Web of Life by Fritjof Capra. What is that? Uh, it's a book about how uh, living systems mm-hmm. are structured mathematically uh, in autopoiesis, which basically means that um, systems that perpetuate themselves mm-hmm. are, are good at perpetuating themselves by definition, right? Mm-hmm. So if you look at evolution, um, evolution is basically saying stuff that's good at sticking around tends to stick around, <laughs> right? It's really no more complicated than that. Uh, and so systems that are designed to stick around, stick around. Crypto, you know, it's, Perfect it's, example. it's infiltrated our minds and our financial systems and whatever. It has a sticking power, right? And that's the definition of sort of an organism that has sticking power. Mm-hmm. I view consensus. I view crypto, Bitcoin, Ethereum. I view these things as organisms. Mm-hmm. That viewpoint probably inhabits almost everything that I, I view really structurally about reality and business. And um, that book is a is a, is a take on that from a deep scientific and philosophical perspective. And it, it's changed the way I look at reality. Interesting. Uh, did you read uh, Algorithms to Live By? I have not. I should read that. It, it's uh, a tangentially related, um, but it's this whole idea that, you know, algorithms and math and, and how it, uh, it relates to a lot of life is uh, pretty cool. Um, all right. So I got one more question, non-crypto related, and then you get to ask me one question before uh, before we end. Um, so I used to ask people if aliens had pets. Right, cause we never uh, we never really think of it that way, but uh, I'm just going to stick with what is the probability that aliens actually exist? What's the number? Uh, so there's an equation called the Drake equation. Okay, oh, I've uh, not heard about this. All right, here we go. <laughs> you should check it out. And and it's basically, you know, the number. It, it makes sense if you think about what it is. It's basically like the number of stars in the universe times mm-hmm. like, you know, the number that ha- you know the number of um, solar systems that seem to have a certain like gaseous Mm -hmm. like characteristic and then you know how many times out of a you know in a probability space it would take to make uh some organic amino acids and stuff Mm -hmm. stuff like that so this is an equation that people um uh what's the answer uh i don't know it really depends on the inputs but you know my real answer is i think close to a hundred percent right i mean i i think um the definition of life right is we tend to think is things that are shaped and, and sized and move at the same speed as us. But, you know, if you look at any system that's good at perpetuating itself, maybe being life, then I think we're deeply inhabited by things all around us that are a bit too fast or too slow or big mm-hmm. or small or made out of stuff that we can't see that are life forms. So I think maybe we're just looking in the wrong place. It, uh, I ask this question to every single guest about aliens, and you would be shocked, at least I'm shocked, how many people believe there's aliens, <laughs> right? Like when I was a kid, that was not a thing, right? <laughs> like, like it was like, all right, shut up, kid, right? You know, you, one day you'll grow up and, and realize this isn't real. I, I mean, I believe there's something out there very similar to kind of how you just described, right? And uh, and, and there's most people who uh, who have any sort of logical um, path to get there. That's why I ask the question, right? It's kind of what's the logic you use to, to try to determine a probability? Is uh, it's pretty cool. It's an interesting one. What uh, what one question do you have for me? So many things. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Um, what do you think uh, the next most successful company that exists looks like? So, damn it, you're supposed to ask me easy ones. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I'm going to cheat, and I'm probably not going to answer that directly, but but I'll answer something uh, close to it. So I have yet to see somebody build an existing large financial financial institution from scratch utilizing 100% of all of the kind of work and benefits and, and technology that is in this industry. And what I mean by that is kind of like your Goldman Sachs example earlier, right? So I don't even know if this is the – right approach to get to the end result but i think that starting out as a pure experiment would be very interesting and so if you look at all of the functions of an asset management firm or, or a bank and you slowly walk through every single one of them and you say what is the blockchain or crypto solution to that and you just rip out the old and put in the new yep. what does that look like right and, and i think the easy answer is like oh it's more efficient right all that kind of stuff but but I, what becomes really interesting, I think the CDPs is a great example, you can become better at underwriting the risk. You can become much better at recovering the collateral, right, in, in loans. Well, what does that look like with equities or with maybe um, some sort of, um, you know, income generating or, or, or yield generating type assets, uh, things like on-chain, um, you know, equity, right, where you actually have, just have like an automated claim on the cash flows of an entity. Um, all that stuff is super, super interesting. Yep. Um, there's people working on pieces of it, right? So it's not fair to say nobody's working on it, but uh, there's the unbundling and rebundling and somebody's going to come along and bundle all this stuff up. Maybe they're successful, maybe they're not. But the person who does that, um, they'll have kind of an early, you know, beachhead with the crypto community because they're excited about all this stuff. But if you can do it in a user experience that is attractive to everyday consumers, I think you got a shot to, you know, really kind of change the way that people think about money and how they interact with their financial institutions and stuff. Um, Anybody's working on it, I'd love to talk to them. <laughs> but yeah. Well, you know, now that you say that, I, I think maybe I formulated the question poorly because I said the word company, right? And mm-hmm. and maybe it's not a company. A Completely. company can only articulate itself at the speed of pieces of paper and boardrooms mm-hmm. and, and votes on decision making. But maybe it's a set of smart contracts, logic, mm-hmm. some humans, some not making decisions faster and with higher complexity than a company ever could. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, we. It, um, I probably shouldn't say who it is, but but somebody uh, who I find incredibly intelligent um, gave me this uh, kind of thought-provoking statement. They said, what if uh, the companies of the futures aren't companies, but they're air traffic controllers? Yeah. Right, and kind of what you're describing of just, you, you basically create some infrastructure and you're sitting there just directing, right? Yep. And, and you've kind of done it in a predefined way or a rules-based way. Um, again, I don't know if that's necessarily the answer, but but it's it's interesting to think about, um, and uh, there's probably some potential there, whether it's you know 100% that way or, or a piece so of it. There's no reason a human or set of humans needs to be at the top of that thing. We, uh, we I, I tweeted yesterday, and uh, I had both the positive and negative benefits of Twitter come after <laughs> me. Um, that I said uh, algorithms over humans. Um. Right, and you know, I, I full well understand that there's a ton of uh, negative side effects and, and cool. kind of dangers, right, with that stuff. Um, but but I do tend to lean towards this idea that most of what you and I do, we're pretty dumb, right? And as humans, uh, machines are better at us. They don't get tired. They're not biased, right? The repetition and, and they're smarter and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but but also, um, we are limited by our intelligence. And machines happen to not only be more intelligent, but they can actually learn now. Yep. And, and, and so if we can uh, start to apply some of that stuff, I think that, you know, you really start to accelerate uh, innovation. You start to accelerate um, all kinds of, you know, different industries. We just need really smart people working on it, right? And, and so uh, that, that's the, uh, the other piece of this is, like, what needs to occur for all of this to come to fruition. And the two things that, you know, we've come to mind for me is, like, we need time because it's got to write code right you got to do this stuff uh, but two is you know i i think that we've kind of taken our eye off the ball of uh intelligent people right intellectual capital coming into the space 17 we got kind of the first wave of you know the people who probably aren't the you know anarchist type that are going to be you know 2011 2012 bitcoiners um then you've got some people in the middle there who are more computer science right than the kind of 13 to 16 and 17 it was the first time that you know you really saw bankers leave a banking job and kind of come in, yep. right? Or you, or you saw kind of the non-technical Silicon Valley folks say, hey, you know what, I want to go do this and dedicate my career to do it. Um, but we need that to persist, 
right and it's probably slowed down a little bit because price and the hype and all that but uh if we can ramp that back up i think um those are the things that really matter in the kind of long-term sustainability I agree. So long, long blockchain and long humans. <laughs> Shit. Man, I, what would be really bad if I started saying long human short bankers? <laughs> right. The only thing I'll leave you with is, have you ever seen, uh, uh, the, and I should caveat this too. I actually think that, you know, Goldman Sachs is incredibly intelligent. They've obviously, you know, one of the best in the world at what they do. Um, but have you ever seen uh, one of the, uh, the octopus things, like the Federal Reserve and, and uh, all these people say about the, the banks and yeah, everything? Yeah, I have it's, seen um, that. It, it, it is uh, long humans short the bankers. <laughs> <Fair> <laughs> all right, enough. man. Listen, thanks, uh, thanks so much for coming. This is awesome. Uh, we'll have to uh, do it again uh, as you guys kind of keep going. Thanks so much, man. Yeah, really cool. Thank you. All right.